Okay. Okay. So I just remind you that uh, when P, the probability of an edge of our random graph is very small, then uh, the chromatic number is also very small with high probability. And uh, in some sense, it's very highly concentrated since um, it just uh, has uh, very few different values. So you understand uh, the chromatic number of every graph and vertices may be equal to uh, any value between one and n. Yes. For example, the complete graph and vertices has chromatic number equal to n, and the empty graph and vertices has chromatic number equal to one. So of course, in principle, it's possible to get any value of the chromatic number of a graph, but uh, for a random graph. For a sparse random graph, as if you understand what a sparse random graph, the probability of an edge is very small. So the graph with high probability is sparse. And in this case, the chromatic number is highly concentrated in uh, very small values. So in the case when p times n squared tends to zero, uh, the chromatic number is just concentrated in one value, which is equal to one. Uh, in the second case, uh, the chromatic number is concentrated, in fact, uh, in the value two, since uh, if you have an p tended to zero and uh, n squared times p not tended to zero, then it's possible to prove that the chromatic number is exactly equal to two, uh, asymptotically or almost sure. And in the third case, uh, the same is true for the value three. So with high probability, as you totally almost surely, the chromatic number is concentrated uh, in the value three, exactly. Almost all graphs which are realized, sparse graphs, have this exactly chromatic number. But uh, this concentration not only works for small, very small values of P, for other values, it also works, but oh, Господи, это опять штука не работает. Не, ну это совершенно невозможно. Не, ну ребят, ну это просто нет слов. Она же работала. Не, ну такого кликера я еще не видал. Что ж такое? Ой, переведи фокус на презентацию. На презентацию, да. Ладно. Загадочно, конечно. Ага. Once again. Uh, so in, in the 80s, uh, in 20th century, of course, uh, Bela Bolobash, a very famous specialist in random graph theory, proved uh, two, in fact, two different amazing results concerning the concentration uh, of the chromatic number of a random graph. So the first theorem uh, is given here. Uh, let P be such that P is smaller than or equal to n to the power mod minus alpha where alpha uh, is strictly greater than one half. Is it possible to understand this condition? <laughs> well, I'll probably discuss it with you, I don't know. So uh, there exists a quantity U depending on M and alpha, uh, such that asymptotically almost surely the chromatic number is concentrated in two values, U and U plus one. So only two values. Uh, what means this condition? Just a second. So simple results from the previous slide were about P, which is little O of one over N squared. Then P was little O of one over N. And in the third, P uh, was equal to C over N, uh, where C was less than one, a constant, yes? 
this was on the previous slide, the three items. <clears throat> but now we assume that E uh, may be equal to N to the power minus alpha, where alpha is greater than one half. So for example, if you have alpha equal, I don't know, uh, 0 0.6, for example, then uh, P equals N to the power minus 0 0.6 or this way. And this is of course much bigger than this situation. <clears throat> so we have a much larger set of possible values of probabilities of edges. And even in this case where P is uh, also going to zero, but not so quickly uh, as uh, in the three first cases, uh, even in this case, the chromatic number is very highly concentrated. It chooses only two possible values from the entire set of n possibilities. <clears throat> uh, this is said here once again. But uh, what is also very interesting here, if alpha is greater than, no, 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 sorry, if alpha is smaller than one, in this case, uh, this value u, which depends on n and alpha, it tends to infinity as n tends to infinity. So if in, in these cases, in these cases, the chromatic number is concentrated in the very small values, one or two or three, and here this function in which uh, the chromatic number is concentrated, and it goes to infinity. This is a different case. You don't understand now? It grows with that, yeah? Ну вот я здесь, считайте, что равно. Так будет понятнее. Действительно, если меньше равно, оно может попасть в эту ситуацию. <clears throat> the question was uh, whether it's possible to make more concrete uh, these dependence. Uh, I say it for those who are in Zoom. But uh, yes, it's possible to make it more concrete. For example, in case where uh, P is also equal to C over N, but C is already greater than one, it's possible to write uh, an exact equality from which it's uh, easy to understand how it behaves. But I don't remember exactly, and I don't want to go into such details. <clears throat> it is possible, of course, to bound it from below and from above by some not very hard, not very complicated methods. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> uh, I'm not sure uh, everyone here wants to hear uh, the proof of this theorem, and I don't suppose to give it, so don't worry. <laughs> don't worry, but uh, it is very interesting, in fact, this proof is based uh, on some concentration inequalities and probability theory. Probably some of you know, uh, of course, everyone should know, I, I guess, <clears throat> what is Chibashov inequality, yes? А все правда знают, что Чебашовская неравенство в теории вероятности, нет? Не все, да? Ну и ладно. Нет, ну это я сейчас долго буду напоминать. I understood, I suddenly realized that not everyone here knows what is Чебашов in equality, but this is not so important for my lecture, so I uh, don't want to speak about Чебашов in equality. But if you know what is Чебашов in equality in uh, probability theory, then uh, what is said here? It's impossible to use this inequality in order to prove such concentration. It's necessary to use much more subtle tools, like uh, Azul's inequality, for example, which is uh, based on Martin Gates. Жутко, да? Ну, забейте, да. Портингал я рассказывать не буду. I will not speak about Martin Gates, don't worry. 
But this is just to, I don't know how to say it, to uh, make it more impressive. <laughs> No. And one more result here. I promised uh, to give two results by Bella Bolobash. Do you understand that Bella Bolobash uh, is a man, not a woman? <laughs> Bella is a name of a man. It's Hungarian mathematician who lives in Cambridge, works in Cambridge. So uh, it's also very interesting to understand what happens in the case uh, where uh, a graph is dense. Here uh, we had sparsity, yes? The graph was very sparse. But if you take probability of an edge equal to one half, or say to one third, to a constant, which doesn't depend on that. In this case, uh, the graph with high probability is very dense. It uh, loses only uh, one half. In average, yes. See, it creates a plane here. So this graph is called dense, and in this case, uh, it's also possible to prove the concentration of the chromatic number around some value. Uh, you asked me about uh, this quantity, and uh, I said some words about it, but uh, I didn't explain the exact uh, behavior of this quantity. And here, uh, such behavior is given. It is given by uh, this ratio n over two uh, times uh, binary logarithm of n. So the chromatic number is highly concentrated with high probability, as it does almost surely, around uh, this ratio. <clears throat> Roughly speaking, as I said here, uh, as it does almost surely, uh, the uniformly taken random graph. You understand if p is equal to one half, every graph has probability one over m. Probably you uh, forgot what is m, but m is the number of all possible graphs on inverses. So m is uh, two to the power n choose two. This is the number of all possible graphs on inverses. And in case uh, when the probability of an edge equals one half, in this case, uh, every graph has the same probability one over this one. You understand it, yes? Mm -hmm. So in this uh, uniform case, uh, asymptotically almost surely, the chromatic number uh, is asymptotically equal to n over two times binary logarithm of n. Understand, okay? But uh, here is a problem. Since uh, for sparse graphs, we had very, very high concentration in just two values. And here, uh, we did not say anything about two or three or four values. We only said uh, that the chromatic number cannot, uh, uh, cannot go very far from this ratio. But uh, the difference between the chromatic number and this ratio uh, may be uh, growing to infinity. Вот эта функция f она может быть равна растущей, понимаете? И тогда это уже не концентрация двух значений, это констант. And this is a problem. It's not yet solved. I invite you to solve this problem. <laughs> no, probably you uh, will not be so enthusiastic about it. In general, this problem is open. It's possible to prove uh, analogous uh, results for different values of p, for example, for other constants. Of course, it's also possible to prove such results. But uh, in general, the problem of high concentration here is uh, not yet solved. Now, uh, what shall I speak about? I'll probably say a few words about uh, more general binomial random graphs. Is it okay or too difficult? Нормально, я очень сложно. Не бери жести. I'm sorry, in the previous slide, uh, how yeah. I can calculate the uh, F is about 
in the proof, in the original proof of Bolobash, F is uh, like something like this. Okay. It is smaller than n over two times log n, but not too much. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, let's go ahead. Let's try to uh, speak about more general random graph models. No. No. Yeah, it shows. Whoa! It's a victory. <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's consider an arbitrary sequence of graphs, G sub n, with some vertex sets, B sub n, and some edge sets, E sub n, actually. An infinite sequence of graphs general infinite sequence. And is not necessarily the number of vertices now. In our previous studies, n was the number of vertices, yes? But now it's not important. The number of vertices may be something else. n is just the number uh, of uh, this graph in a sequence. <clears throat> Now, uh, as usual, let's uh, consider some function p of n, uh, which is again an edge probability. For every edge, the same probability, but uh, it is applied only to the edges of uh, these graphs g sub n, to the edges from the sets e sub n. So we don't consider other edges of uh, a complete graph on uh, this number of vertices, cardinality of E sub n, we consider uh, only the edges uh, from the set E sub n. And uh, we keep an edge from this set independently from each other with the same probability P of n. There's not a specific concrete graph, не полный, и мы каждый его либо сохраняем или не сохраняем. Никакие другие ребра мы вообще не смотрим. Если их не было в множестве Е, мы их не смотрим. I just said the same as was, was said in English many before. Uh, so here uh, N in uh, EN is not uh, the number of vertices. It can be the number of vertices, but not necessarily. It's uh, the number of the graph. It's uh, the number of the graph, yes. G sub one, maybe something, G sub two, maybe something else, and so on. And every graph in the sequence of graph is a random graph. No, no, no. Uh, 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 in this sequence, G sub n, everything is fixed. But uh, after we take P, then we consider a random subgraph of this graph, G sub n. So, so we randomly skip some. Edges yes. From this yes. Yes. Some uh, maybe some motivation. For example, uh, uh, let me remind you. Yesterday's motivation about computers and connections between them. <clears throat> Just a second. To be more clear, do you remember the compute the computers? in different cities in the world, and uh, there were some connections. In our previous studies, all the, connection, uh, all the connections existed, yes? But uh, sometimes it's not a very realistic assumption, since it's not too realistic to assume that every connection on the complete graph on this number of vertices exists, yes? For example, we may have the same number of vertices, but only say such connections. But in this case, which is more realistic than the previous one, it's also very uh, natural to have some probability of an advisor of an adversary who wants to kill our edges. So this probability one minus p, he kills our edge independently of each other, and this probability p, uh, the edge is kept. Yes, it's not this. Понятно, да? Мотивация главная. Do you understand the motivation? So it's much more general 
and in fact, uh, much more nation. Okay. I have not yet finished the definition, probably. So if you take a graph on the same set of vertices, but uh, with some other set of edges, let me uh, write it down on the whiteboard. I mean that uh, we have this graph and we have its subgraph without end here. Do you see? The difference. Uh, so E, of course, is a subset of E sub n. And the probability of getting such a graph is called spine uh, Osterling by graph Barusky. It's called spine subgraph of GN. It means to the scale from North Sundershin process. It's the same set of vertices. Spine is a graph with the same set, subgraph of, uh, with the same set of vertices. Uh, then we put probability of this graph equal to p to the power cardinality of this e of this e uh, times one minus p to the power cardinality of this e sub n minus the cardinality of e. So uh, in our previous studies, instead of the cardinality of e sub n, we had n choose two. Yes. But we had it. Yes. Uh, and the probability of graph G sub n, among, we make probability among all all the sets which we defined in the first string. Or because why is it that it is that it is that it is that I'll try to explain again. Probably it's too difficult, but I don't know. Uh, in our previous studies, we considered uh, K sub n, which is a complete graph on n vertices. Yes. yes? Yeah. Complete graph on n vertices. And uh, we took a random subgraph of it. How did we do it? We uh, considered every graph on the same set of vertices and we put uh, probability of this graph equal to p to the number uh, of edges of this graph times one minus p to uh, the power n choose two minus the number of edges. So the probability space consisted of all possible graphs on the vertices whose number is equal to two to the power n choose two as usual, m, yes, uh, and uh, Every property of a graph was, a, was an event, and the probability of every property was the sum of all possible probabilities of the graph, the graphs having this property. Uh, in our more general case, we consider not k sub n, but some g sub n with a set of vertices e sub n and set of edges e sub n. And uh, we take uh, an arbitrary uh, graph of this form e is a subset of E sub n, and we define its probability as the value p to the power cardinality of e times one minus p to the power n choose two, not n choose two, of course, but cardinality of E sub n minus cardinality of e. So uh, the probability space here consists of all possible spinning subgraphs of the graph G sub n. Yes, yes. То есть мы рассматриваем все основные подграфы граф уже уже. Ну, сколько этих основных подграфов? Ну, вот сколько? Нет. Два в степени мощности. Когда на слайде показано P, они знают P. Чего? P от N. Ну, подграфы, да. Я я неправильно написал, да? У вас P от N. А, это ужасно. Это катастрофа. Куда я сделал кликер? Ага. Интересно. Ой! Ой! It's, it's of course a mistake. It's print. Uh, конечно, это опечатка. PRG, конечно, они PRG. Извините. Yes, it's... Вы столько как пришло, множество восстанавливаете вероятность. Ой, sorry, sorry. 
It's a skewed skew to new screen, of course. Very skewed to new screen. <coughs> P of 3. Now, everything is here. <coughs> okay. Let's continue. <coughs> Uh, this first uh, first item uh, I have already explained it here. Yes, it's about uh, the complete uh, the complete graph, the Schrödinger graph is a particular case of this model. Of course, I already explained it. Uh, there is another very interesting and famous example of a sequence of graphs on vertices, not on vertices, but in the, in the, sorry. Uh, so. Maybe it's better to explain it here on the whiteboard. <clears throat> so we take some uh, underlying set, not a set of vertices, but just some uh, underlying set consisting of numbers 1.1, 1. 1, 2, and so on, n. But uh, we use for vertices of this graph all possible R element subsets of this set. Sample. So fast. All possible R element subsets of this set. Okay, let's consider an example. <clears throat> Let n be equal to 5 and r be equal to 2. Okay, so we have the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And what are the vertices here? The vertices are all possible two element subsets of this set. Whew. One, two, one, three, terrible. One, four, huh? one, five. One, five, yes. <laughs> I'll put uh, such vertices. Uh, what else? Two, three, yes, lexicographic order. Two, four, yes, 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 two, five. Two, five, three, four, uh, three, five, and finally, four, five, yes. Of course, five choose two is equal to 10, yes? 10 vertices here or not? Boy, this is real success. Now, what are the edges of this graph? We join by an edge two uh, vertices if and only if the corresponding two element subsets do not intersect at all. So one, two intersects one, three, one, four, one, five. Here we don't have a, 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 an edge, any edge. But uh, here also we don't have an edge, but for one, two and uh, three, four, we must draw an edge. For uh, this, we don't have an edge. For this, we don't have an edge. Here, uh, we also don't have an edge. But here, we draw an edge. And so on. Do you understand? That will graph here. Uh, in the general case, in the more general case, uh, we consider some value n. We consider some value r. And we have, of course, and choose R vertices. So you see, this is the example, an example in which uh, the number of vertices and the number of a graph are different in general. <clears throat> okay. More examples. Ah, by the way, if you uh, open Wikipedia, <laughs> Or if you try to do it by yourselves, uh, you uh, can show that in this case, in fact, it's possible to draw this graph in the following way. Uh, 
It's called Peterson graph. It's a famous graph which has many good properties. For example, it's a Knieser graph for uh, these two values of N and R. Uh, in general, this graph is called Knieser after uh, a mathematician who worked on it in the 50s. It is graph <coughs> Okay, uh, but if you take R equal to one, you again come back uh, to the classical case. This is just a complete graph on inverse. You understand, yes? Uh, if you take uh, two R greater than N, so R is big, very big, then of course uh, you get an empty graph. No vertices are connected by an edge. If R is big enough, of course, every two subsets overlap. You have a set of n elements, and you have very big R, such that 2R is greater than n. Of course, every two uh, R element subsets intersect here, so you get an empty graph. You understand? А ребро проводится, когда они не пересекаются, поэтому получается пустой граф, ни одного ребра. One more example. If n is exactly equal to 2 times r, then uh, we obtain a matching. Do you know this matching? Also introductory part of our course. Uh, matching – это um, пара сочетания просто называется. Это отдельно стоящий ребра. Uh, actually, if R is equal to N over 2, 2R two is equal to N, then uh, to every uh, R element subset, we can uh, assign exactly one additional uh, R element subset which doesn't intersect the first one. So we have such uh, separate uh, edges like this. <coughs> It's a match. Okay. Oh. Oh. It's also a mistake. Haha. K3, 5-2, of course, not 5-3. Since K3, 5-3 uh, is the case when 2R is greater than N. It's a stupid mistake again. I'm, I'm sorry. <coughs> okay. What can be said about the chromatic number of Knezer graph? It's a very interesting story. Very interesting story. I also don't want to prove lots of stand points. A great story. I'll discuss it with you. So in order to obtain now some introductory part, you know I have this course of two lectures. It is introduction to graph theory. But I give you a lot of results which are not introductory ones. Yes, that's true. Okay, but uh, introductory part here is how to uh, make lower bounds for the chromatic number in general case. This is, of course, very important. Of course, very important for applications as well, since you must uh, know how to bound in general the chromatic numbers from below or from above. But here we discuss. Uh, lower bounds. <coughs> eh? uh -huh. uh, yesterday we spoke about this earlier a little bit when I asked you uh, which properties of graph do you know. We spoke about click number. So omega of G uh, denotes the maximum number of vertices in a click. What is a click? It's a complete subgraph. Any complete subgraph of a graph is called clique. And the maximum number of vertices uh, in such a clique in a graph is denoted by omega of G and is called uh, clique number of a graph. 
For example, if you have a complete graph on adverses, what is the speed number? N. N, of course, very simple. And if you have a, a simple cycle on adverses, what is its peak number? Very funny question. Is that? Almost surely. Uh, except the situation. Uh, except uh, the triangle. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, except e e huh? And except the point. I think I'll answer. Ah, mm -hmm. uh, so, so uh, if you have a cycle on three vertices, this is a triangle, of course. And it has chromatic number equal to three, and leak number also is equal to three. But in uh, every other case, when n is greater than or equal to four, for example, uh, the leak number is equal to two. So the only leak here is uh, an edge. Yes? Two verses. Uh, if a graph is empty, doesn't contain any edge, what is its leak number? One, yes, yes. One vertex is also a lead. It doesn't have any edges, but contains all possible edges. Oh, it's a lead by definition. Complete graph on one vertex. Okay. Uh, there is an opposite quantity, which is also very important, uh, and it's called uh, not anti click number, but it's called independence number in graph theory. So, uh, by an independent set in the set of vertices, we mean every set of vertices without any edge. A set of vertices which doesn't contain two vertices of an edge. And what else? No, 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 for example, if you consider uh, a cycle on inverses, a simple cycle on inverses, just a polygon like here, a simple cycle on inverses, what is its independence number, the maximum number of uh, vertices in an independent set? Entire part of n over two years. So they just have that problem. Через один, да. Но по принципу дифферения больше уже не сделал. По пижон хол принципу, это impossible to increase this number, and uh, of course it's possible to make uh, an independent set of this uh, uh, cardinality just by taking such verses. Через один. Okay, alpha and omega. Alpha of G is the independence number and uh, omega of G is peak uh, number. <coughs> is it obvious? Here it's written down that uh, the following two inequalities are obvious. I think uh, the first one is probably really obvious. If you have a click in a graph, of course, you must use to color it the number of colors, which is equal to the number of vertices in this clip. So if you have a big clip of cardinality omega of G, then you use to color it exactly omega of G colors. And of course, high of G, the real chromatic number of the graph, uh, is bounded from below by omega of G. I have that. You understand? Okay, uh, but the second inequality probably is not so easy for uh, maybe uh, at least some of you. How to prove that the chromatic number is bounded from below by uh, cardinality of V uh, over alpha of G. In fact, this is very simple, but uh, you must uh, be familiar with uh, definitions. If you understand deeply the definitions, of course you understand that this is uh, exactly pigeon hole principle. So this is very simple. In fact, I'll prove it. <clears throat> yeah, I just remind you uh, what is the chromatic number of a graph? It's the minimum number high such that uh, the set of vertices of this graph may be partitioned 
partitioned into high parts such that for every i and for every two vertices x and y from b sub i, uh, the pair is not an edge. But what do you see here? What is uh, b sub i in our new terms? You see, b sub i is such that for every two vertices inside it, the pair is not an edge. It's an independent set. Every color is in fact an independent set. So of course, of course, uh, cardinality of V equals the sum of cardinalities of V sub one, V sub high. And every such cardinality is uh, at most, at most alpha of G. Alpha of G independence number is the maximum number of vertices in, a, in an independent set, but these are independent sets. So everything here is bounded from above by alpha of G. So this is high times alpha of G, and now we read from this part to the left. So high is greater than or equal to cardinality of V over alpha of G. The result? Have I brought it? Okay, fine. Oh, very good. Uh, in fact, uh, since uh, high of G, just a second, since high of G uh, is an integer number, then it's possible to put here upper entire part. Yes, it's all I just love. Не меньше дроби, то оно не меньше, чем верхняя целая часть от этой дроби. If an integer number is not less than a ratio, a fraction, then it's of course possible to put here the entire part of this form. <coughs> okay. Just a second. Hello? Я сейчас лекцию читаю. Ну, вот закончу, тогда поеду. Сейчас за ерунда. Two lost calls and two SMS. Too many. Okay. Let's try to use uh, these two inequalities, these two inequalities for Knesset's graph. <clears throat> but uh, I forgot. First of all, let's uh, use some upper bound. Let's make some upper bound for the chromatic number of Knesset graph. Uh, it's written down here that the chromatic number of Knesset graph is bounded from above by n. We just color into i's color. Those vertices are subsets of the n set, which contain the element i. Uh, I write it. <clears throat> so we had uh, this underlying set consisting of an elements and the vertices were R element subsets. Do you remember? Yes. Now we take, for example, one, and we consider all possible R element subsets which contain this element one. They are pairwise intersecting. Yes. Papa, you guys. So uh, no edges appear. This, uh, this is an independent set of vertices. An independent set of vertices. Yes. Okay, so it's possible to color them into the first color. The same is done for those vertices uh, which uh, have not yet been colored, but uh, contain the element two. And we color all such vertices into the second color, and so on. So the chromatic number of KG, the graph, is parameters N and R, is bounded from above by N. It's possible to replace this bound by a little bit uh, better one. Uh, 
since uh, what is very simple, uh, uh, it's very easy to see that uh, if you have here n, uh, n minus r plus one, and you already used this color, then there exists no other r element subsets which are not yet colored. It's impossible to put an R element subset in the set of cardinality R minus one. Yes, we will have a grassy if R minus R plus one is enough. That does not mean that we need R to assume the kusok that will be much more. Am I clear now? But uh, even better, you see here N minus two R plus two. How to do it? You go from one to to n minus two r plus two, plus one, sorry. You use so many colors. And it remains to color only those vertices which are completely inside the set of cardinality two r minus one. Остается пока что такие, при которых вызывают вот сюда. But uh, in this case, every, r, uh, every two r element subsets uh, of this set are pairwise intersecting. Every two intersect. So uh, you just use one color in order to color all of them. And so n minus two r plus one plus one is exactly equal to n minus two r plus two. No questions. Was it possible to understand how I colored by so many colors? <clears throat> Fine. Uh, there exists a famous result. I am mm, fond of proving it. Обожаю его доказывать. Вот, но не буду сейчас. Ибо копно. Это долго. Копно, долго его доказывал. Красиво, безумно. It's absolutely beautiful theorem. Ernst Cohen, Rado, three authors, proved in 1961. It's of 1961 was proved. It's a, an absolutely wonderful result by its proof. Uh, but uh, the formulation is very simple. How many sets uh, do contain the element one? How many R element subsets of the set of an element contain uh, the element one? It is written down on, uh, on the presentation n minus one to z minus one. Uh, I thought it was uh, easy, no? Uh, we just take every uh, r minus one elements from the set consisting of two, three, and so on n, and uh, of course the number of such r minus one elements subsets is exactly equal to n minus one in cardinality of this set. Choose R minus one. Yes? So uh, this is a very simple uh, lower bound for alpha. There exists uh, such a set, such an independent set of cardinality N minus one choose R minus one. It exists. So alpha is, of course, bounded from below by this binomial coefficient. The beauty of this theorem is to prove that it's impossible to create uh, a bigger independent set in this graph. And this is much more uh, non trivial. <clears throat> uh, it is uh, said here that both general lower bounds give almost the same result. Let us discuss it a little bit more precisely, accurately. <clears throat> So we know that alpha of G of KG and R, alpha of KG and R due to Erdos Cohen and Rado, uh, it is exactly equal to N minus one choose R minus one. So the general bound by the cardinality over alpha equals N choose R 
over n minus r uh, n minus one choose r uh, r minus one. Yes. What it is? This is an over r. Here you have n factorial. Here you have an n minus one factorial. So the ratio is equal to n. Here you have r factorial, and this r minus one factorial goes to uh, numerator. So this is n over r. But uh, uh, as you remember, it's possible to put here entire part. So in fact, this bound, this general bound, gives such result. Now, what can be said about uh, omega, about uh, the maximum peak, how to create uh, a big peak uh, in case of graph? What shall we do? We shall consider R element subsets, which are? Yes, pair wise non intersecting Papan and Ibisikavishis, right? It's a so Razuit Sibro. An edge is created if and only if the corresponding cardinal subsets do not intersect. So we have to take uh, as much as possible such R element subsets. But this is, of course, very simple. You have this underlying set, and you just take first R elements, then also R elements, and so on. So, how many such words do we have? Yes, n over r, but uh, the entire part here is of this form. So this is the near cell and the near cell and the chest. In our gun, it is to look for that difference. This inequality is sometimes uh, a little bit better than this one. This one is given by omega, this one is given by the seventh uh, inequality cardinality of V over alpha. And uh, if n is not divisible by r, in this case, this lower bound is a little bit better. But this is fine. Unfortunately, both such bounds are far enough from the upper one. Yes? Um, and minus 2 n. I told you I'm it now. <clears throat> what is true? We can vote. More from Brazil, Savat. There was a famous Gnesser conjecture. You point to some of Gnesser. There was a famous Gnesser conjecture that uh, the upper bound is true. Gnesser proposed it in the 50s. Exactly what? It was proved. Only in 1970, I don't remember, just a second, 1978, by a very famous mathematician, Laszlo Lovas. Have you heard about him probably? No. He's a very famous mathematician. Nobody will deny him. What is denied is he doesn't tell you what is denied. Uh, okay, but uh, what is even more interesting here uh, is not uh, about his famous results and so on, but uh, uh, he proved his combinatorial assertion by using topology. On the sports of Nostalgia, you produce the topology to talk to the Gazette, the chief combinatorial result. Again, the Gracie Majority, the proof is absolutely beautiful. But also, it's impossible to give it here. It's very hard in some sense. <clears throat> okay. Poof. Are you ready to hear something about random subgraphs of Tesla's graphs? There are two very interesting results uh, on, written down here on this slide. So, we denote uh, the random subgraph of Knesset's graph in this way. So we add P after N and R as an index here. K sub N R P. It's a random subgraph of Knesset's graph. Are you alive? Good. Uh, 
the main and the most interesting result here is due to Bolobar. He's a PhD student, uh, Narayanan, now he's not already a PhD student, he got his PhD and he works, I don't remember where, but uh, he worked in Cambridge for some years. Now I don't remember his disposition. And uh, I also was a participant of this work. Uh, it was proved in, in 2016. Oi, какая математика. So uh, I have to try to explain what happens. First of all, I, I don't want to write down here anything, but maybe I will be forced to do it. I don't know. So uh, fix some epsilon. Okay, fix some epsilon. Now let's assume that R, the cardinality of every set, which is a vertex of this graph, yes, may be a function of n. But uh, this function is greater than or equal to 2. And also it is little o of n to the power one third. It's not so important. Uh, for you, maybe it's uh, easier to understand that r is a constant, for example. Let's consider r equal to a constant. r equals 2. r equals 20. You understand? Заметьте на то, что есть такая общность, но просто считайте, что это константа, например. Опять медленно растущая функция, не важно. Окей, now uh, we define the following p sub c. Uh, p sub c is a threshold probability. In some sense, you will understand it afterwards. This is like a parvocable variety. What is its value? r plus 1. For example, if r is a constant, r plus 1 is also a constant, of course. Uh, here, this subtraction r times log r, log is natural log, it's a constant. Doesn't matter. Of course, if r may be closer to n to the power one third, Mm, this term is already uh, meaning something, but uh, for us, for you, uh, this is not so important right now. So just for, for, forget about it. Uh, you, you probably don't see uh, by, by what value uh, it is divided. It is divided by uh, n minus 1 choose r minus 1. Here in the denominator, you have the same binomial coefficient. As n tends to infinity, what happens? The main result here, alpha of the random subgraph equals exactly the independence number of the initial graph, asymptotically almost surely, if p is greater than or equal to 1 plus epsilon times p sub c, and uh, is not equal to uh, the initial independence number, asymptotically almost surely, if p is less than or equal to 1 minus epsilon times p sub c. You understand why I call it uh, a threshold probability? Что чуть-чуть мы подпрыгнули над ней, и почти наверняка число независимости даже на единичку не отличается, хотя мы взяли случайный граф. Оно вообще не изменяется. Чуть-чуть мы спрыгнули с этого порога вниз, умножили на 1 минус эпсилон, и уже радости не будет. But, uh, okay, let's discuss it uh, in the following way. Do you understand uh, what uh, should happen to the independence number if you delete some edges of a graph? You had some independence number of the initial graph. Now you deleted some edges randomly. What should happen to the independence number? It can become. Of course, it can become bigger. And here you have this critical probability, P sub C, uh, which uh, goes where as n times infinity? Do you see? Log n times some constant over n minus 1 choose r minus 1. Do you understand? It tends to zero. 
estás listo. <laughs> so the probability of keeping an edge is very small. It goes to zero. And the probability of uh, deleting it goes to one. Nevertheless, with high probability, I think totally almost surely, if P is greater than or equal to one plus epsilon times P sub C, uh, we don't have any movement for the value of the independence number. It doesn't grow. Intuitively, it must grow. We have deleted a lot of edges. A wonderful stability. That would give you a choice. Мы почти все ребра с высокой вероятностью удаляем, а число независимости даже на единичку не растет. It's very strange, <coughs> but this happens. Uh, not yet solved. What happens uh, in the middle, uh, we don't know. So if we don't multiply it by one plus epsilon or by one minus epsilon, just take this up C, uh, we cannot calculate uh, the asymptotics of this probability. What happened to my microphone? It was not so loud. <clears throat> and for chromatic numbers, uh, it's also possible to prove a result, which is uh, already not about stability, as in the case of independence numbers, but uh, about asymptotic stability. The chromatic number of Knezer's graph equals, just a second, chromatic number of Knezer's graph equals n minus 2r plus 2. r is a constant, okay? We probably have to have constant. So asymptotically, the chromatic number equals n. And here for the random subgraph, asymptotically, almost surely, it also equals n asymptotically. Yeah, no, I know, so if you add which is like a poly is logarithm, then it will be equal to n asymptotically. You understand it, yeah? Uh, but uh, here the result is very, very tight. So the difference between the upper bound and the lower one is only by the values of these two constants, C sub one and C sub two. I don't remember how they behave, what are them, but this is not so important. And for R, which is uh, exactly equal to two, there is a small difference you see, for R which is greater than or equal to 3, uh, we subtract from N this root of logarithm. But here we subtract uh, the same root. But under uh, the root, we have not only log, but also log log. Huh? Okay, let's go to uh, connectivity. It's a terrible case since I have to oh, yo, 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 press this very many times. Oh, now I proceed to connectivity of random graphs. I think uh, you had a lot of information about the chromatic numbers and their bounds. So it's time to speak about some other property, about connectivity. Do you remember why connectivity is very important for graph theory? Yes, this model with computers. Of course, if you keep connections, it's possible to transfer uh, the information from every vertex to every other vertex. And if you don't keep it, you already don't have this infrastructure. <clears throat> okay. A wonderful theorem here is due to Anders and Rainey. It's also very impressive in some sense. Probably I'll say a few words about uh, how it, it's possible to prove it. Okay, wonderful theorem. Oh. <laughs> Let's assume that the probability of an edge. Oh, this is of course Anders and Rainey model. So I don't speak about general model right now. Uh, we consider the probability of an edge equal to this fraction, natural logarithm of n plus something over n. Let's assume that c is a constant for now. Uh, in this case, the probability that a graph g is connected goes to, this is a wonderful part of this theorem, 
tends to e to the power minus e to the power minus c. You see? So what does it mean? It means that log over n, this fraction logarithm over n, is a very sharp threshold for connectivity. Uh, I'll explain it. So if C is a very big positive constant, billion, Google, then e to the power minus C, e to the power minus C, the second part, the second floor of this tower, yes? Uh, e to the power minus C is very, very small, yes? Almost zero. So the first floor, E to the power minus E to the power minus C is very, very close to one. E to the power something which is very close to zero almost equals, uh, almost equals one, yes? Almost equals one. Uh, in the opposite case, if C is a very big but negative constant, minus Google, then e to the power minus C is even much, much bigger, yeah? It's a, an absolutely great, impossible number, much bigger than the number of electrons in uh, the universe. Uh, and when you take e to the power minus this number, you get almost zero, yes? So if C is positive and big, then uh, this probability is very close to one. If C is negative and big in absolute value, then this probability is very close to zero. So this is a very sharp threshold for connectivity. If you go to the right, of this fraction, then uh, with high probability you get connectivity. If you go to the left, with high probability you don't get connectivity. Yes? Okay, fine. Uh, what does it mean in practice, for example? Aha. It's also possible to explain it. For example, it's possible to formulate a bit more concrete result about the speed of uh, the probability going to one when we speak about connectivity. So for example, a theorem, a following theorem may be proved if uh, say P equals three logarithm of N over N and n is greater than or equal to 100, then the probability of G to be connected you understand it tends to, to one, yes? If C is B. Here, you even don't plus this C, but you multiply by C. So of course it goes to one. But uh, I can bound it from below by, for example, this y. For practice, it's necessary to understand how uh, fastly, how quickly uh, it is going to, to one, this probability. Uh, so, for example, if you had 2,000 different computers in different cities, 2,000, yes? And they, uh, they were pairwise connected. Put this value into this formula. I promise you, you can do it on computer or calculator, I don't know. But I promise you, you'll get something like approximately 0 0.02. You can check if you want. So, uh, the probability of keeping an edge is very small, very close to zero. Yes? But nevertheless, the probability of keeping uh, connectivity for the whole system uh, is about 0 0.9995.
you asked me why to consider functions for p why to consider p depending on n not a constant this is a very good example to understand why it is necessary in practice i have never that <clears throat> it's a, an amazing result in some sense so very high probability of keeping connectivity also the probability of keeping uh, one connection was very very small uh, i can try to explain uh, what this function means i can try to explain but i'm not sure i will i will be able to do it am i going uh, one question from probability theory. No, the first question about probability theory. Do you know probability theory a little bit? Have you got some courses on probability theory? Okay, so uh, you shall know in this case what is uh, an expectation of a random variable. Что такое мат ожидания? Все знают? О, oh, wonderful! Everyone knows what is an expectation of a random variable. So let's consider the following random variable dependent on a graph. It's defined as the number of isolated vertices. Isolated vertices. Do I understand what is an isolated? Well, most of the time, refrain got a red deal instead. The vertex uh, which has degree Z doesn't have any edge. <clears throat> Number of isolated vertices. Now it's um, the main question. How to calculate the expectation of this random value? Let's try to calculate the expectation. What is uh, an average number of isolated vertices in a random graph, in an Erdős and Rain random graph? Do you remember the following principle? It's called linearity of expectation. Means you know that if x, for example, equals x sub one plus x sub two, then the expectation of this sum is equal to the sum of the expectations you know yes right eh? okay just a second mm -hmm. i assert here that the number of isolated vertices can be uh, calculated uh, as the sum of n random variables. Which random variables shall I use? What does it mean x sub 1, x sub 2? Not probability, but uh, this is random variable, so it's a quantity. Indicator of... Uh, indicator, yes, yes. It's indicator of, of what? What the Yes, x sub i of g is equal to 1 if i vertex i is isolated in g and zero in other case we just sum up such indicators of course we have in total the number of isolated vertices in this graph uh, what is the expectation of every such indicator is the probability that uh, x equals one yes one times this probability plus zero times this probability so this is exactly the probability of i to be isolated what is the probability of a fixed vertex to become isolated in random graph yes 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 you are right so the expectation of x equals n times one minus p to the power n minus one 
you understood everyone why it was so. We fix some vertex, we have n minus one other vertices, and we calculate the probability that no edge appears here. We have n minus one edges that must be deleted, and the probability to be deleted is this one. We sum up n values which are equal to one minus p to the power n minus one, so we have this expectation. Okay. Now, a bit of analysis of calculus. Uh, n times uh, n times one minus p to the power n minus one equals n times e to the power n minus one times ln one minus p. I think this is absolutely simple, yes? Okay, n minus one is asymptotically equal to n. This is trivial. Uh, log one minus p is asymptotically equal to minus p, since p tends to zero. So we have n times e to the power one plus little o of one times n and times minus p. Yes? One plus little o of one means that uh, this is not exactly equal to this, but asymptotic. Now, uh, let's take just a second. Let's take P of this form. Not so precise as here, of course, but uh, of this form. Okay, you see N times E to the power minus one plus little log one. Uh, N times P is C times log N, yes? Now E to the power log N is N. So we have here this N times this N, but this one is to the power minus C one plus little log one, yes? And you see if C is greater than one strictly, if C is greater strictly than one, then uh, this formula, this multiplication tends to zero. And if C is less than one strictly, then this multiplication tends to uh, infinity. So what does it mean? Uh, if you uh, are uh, upper than this uh, threshold function, C is greater than one, then uh, with very high probability, you will not have isolated vertices. And if uh, C is smaller than one, you are below this threshold function, then uh, you may assume that with high probability, you will have some isolated vertices. Uh, you know that if uh, expectation goes to infinity, it doesn't mean the probability is high, since you must consider uh, variance as well. Как раз Чебушевская неравенство, которое мы сегодня обсуждаем, мы его не все знают, как выяснилось. Вот, но сам тем не менее интуиция это есть, да? Uh, I gave you some intuition. I tried to give you some intuition. If you are upper this threshold function, then uh, with high probability, you uh, at least don't have isolated vertices. If you are below it, uh, then with high probability, you have uh, isolated vertices. And this means that graph is not connected. Is that right? I will speak in Russian. No, we are going to go up the и, скорее всего, изолированных вершин нет. Может быть, конечно, другое откололось. Не изолированная вершина, хоть больше островов. Но может доказать, что и оно не отколется. Это уже там какое-то усилие требуется. Наоборот, если c меньше единицы, мы под порогом, то бесконечность стремится ожидаемое количество изолированных вершин. Это еще не означает, что вероятность наличия изолированной вершины высокая. Но если чуть повозиться, может доказать. Но уж если есть изолированные вершины, связаны с ними. 
То есть вот такой вот, такая интуиция просто, как доказывать вот такого рода теоремы. Но он там как доказательство гораздо сложнее. Окей. Okay. Ага. Uh -huh. I already told it to you with a lot of details. Uh, and one more result, much more general, not only for Erdos and Rainy model, but for a very general class of models which were discussed today. <coughs> Grigory Margulis in 1974 proved the following result. Let's consider an arbitrary sequence uh, of graphs G sub n and denote by G sub n p uh, the random subgraphs. An ordinary binomial model, in general case. Uh, now remind uh, what we mean by edge, connect uh, edge connectivity. The edge connectivity of a graph is the minimum number of edges to be removed from this graph in order it loses uh, connectivity. This is called the edge connectivity. For example, if a graph is uh, of this form has a bridge, something, a bridge and something, then the edge connectivity equals one. You just kill this edge and it becomes not connected. Yes. No. yes. <coughs> Now I assume that edge connectivity of G sub n uh, tends to infinity as n tends to infinity. So this is not uh, an absolutely arbitrary sequence of graphs. We assume that uh, the edge connectivity goes to infinity. Uh, in every such case, it's possible to find a threshold function. Here, a threshold function was log n over n, but uh, Margulis proves that in every such case, it's possible to find some p star of n, some threshold function. In the same sense, if p of n, a probability of an edge, is less than or equal to c times p star of n with some constant which is smaller than one strictly, then asymptotically, almost surely g and p is disconnected. And if p of n is greater than or equal to some constant which is greater than one times p star of n, then asymptotically, almost surely, g is connected. So in every such case, it's possible to find a threshold function. This is very important. Very sharp threshold. Okay, I remind you once again this principle. Не потому математик прекрасно, что у нее есть приложение, а наоборот. And that's all. Thank you.